Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Today we're going to look at integrating this ET200 SP distributed I.O. rack of I.O. with an S7 POC. If you missed the last episode, I'm using the S7-1200 because I think it's a unique advantage of this little POC. A lot of people look at this and say, hey, that's like a little micro, but this little guy, when you add distributed I.O., it acts just like it's a bigger cousin, the S7-1500. And I think that's pretty amazing because I know other vendors have small little micros like this and they don't do remote I.O. If they don't do them at all, if they do do them, it's like you got to do custom instructions and all kinds of stuff. It's not easy. So in any case, if you have an S7-1500, the procedure we're going to use is the same, but I'm using the 1200 just because I think it's an impressive feature of the 1200 to be able to do distributed I.O. just like it's bigger sibling. Now, before we get started, I do want to say that uh, Siemens did send in this hardware and they did sponsor this episode to make it ad free. So thank you Siemens for that. Now with that said, of course, all my opinions are my own and there will be an extended version of this video that is just for members. So if you want to get into some of the gory details of it, like you would if you were in my course at the automation school, um, you can be a member just for $5 a month. So with that said, let's go ahead and integrate this guy in to this S7-1200. First thing we'll do though, is we'll go over to the computer here and I'll put my glasses on and here you can see the program. This is the program from the last video. And what I did is I removed the IO. So everything else is the same. The, I didn't want to have to redo the line of logic and all the tag names and all that. So in any case, this is the same one that we used before. I just saved it as a new name and deleted the IO. And so the first thing I'm going to do here is uh, you can see here I'm in devices and networks and uh, you can see the program was just button the button. And then if we come down here to online access and I will go to my ethernet module there and I will do update all accessible devices. So that's my internal ethernet card. And you can see I get the PLC at uh, 2.112 and it's looking for accessible devices and I have everything else off in the office except for this particular device. And you can see I reset it to factory default. So we're just seeing the Mac address. So let me go online with it. And sadly, we can't get any details about it here, but we can go into the functions and assign it an IP address and a Profinet name. Um, but we're not going to do that just yet. Okay. So let's go back to our devices and networks in this project and let's add that existing unit in. Now I'll add it manually later for members who want to see that kind of stuff. But right now I want to show you the easy way of doing this, which I think most people would use, which would be to go online and then go to hardware detection, Profinet devices from network. And let's see what we get here. Okay. I'll do the start search. Again, the device out there, that ET200 uh, unit out there does not have, um, an IP address, I reset it to factory defaults, and you can see it right there. So let me go ahead and add this in to my project. And the cool thing about this is it's going to add all the IO modules. So this particular unit has four IO modules. We'll see them in a minute, but this one has uh, a couple of digital and a couple of analog. Matter of fact, I'll go out to the uh, overhead cam in a moment and we'll take a closer look at this. This is the particular unit I talked about in another video. Up oh, here it is. It's all added in and I can't, uh, we get here to connect them. There we go. And now let's take a look at what we have here. And it's read in all the IO, including the server module, right? So we have the digital lens, digit, uh, and then the digital out, analog in and analog out. And plus we have this unit here. Let's let me go out to the other camera here and we'll take a look at it here. Stop bumping the table here so it doesn't shake around too much, but uh, I'm really zoomed in on it. And I did that because I wanted to kind of show you, let me slide it over here show you this unit. This is the unit. If you missed one of my previous uh, episodes, this is the uh, interface module, the IM 155 6PN slash 3HF. Unlike the one we looked at in the previous episode, this one is uh, not a standard. It's a high functionality and it actually lets you have up to three ports on it. Now you can see it actually has four ports, right? But you only can use three of them. But this is great for those situations where maybe you're daisy chaining from uh, rack the rack the rack out there in the field from distributed IO to distributed IO, but you need a port for maybe a bulkhead connector so you can program or you have an HMI on that uh, in that cabinet. And uh, I just think this is great because you can have your in, your out, and then you can have a third one for whatever you want. It like makes a T out of the connection. 
Now, this one's a little bit different because uh, instead of the 16-point modules I had in the unit I used yesterday, here I have an 8-point in and an 8-point out. Okay, 24 volts DC. And you can see this one's a basic, and that one's a standard. Okay, very interesting there. And then um, you can see I got an analog in basic and an analog out standard. Okay, some of these modules were actually, I picked up some of these um, during the, uh, the part shortage because I needed parts to put this together. And um, so I picked them up secondhand, but most of the stuff is new from Siemens. So in any case, and I wired it all in. And you may be asking, Sean, let me uh, zoom out here a little bit. You may be, Sean, how come you don't have as many buttons on this one as you did on the last one? And that's because I wanted to leave room for some um, uh, potentiometers and, and um, you know, analog gauges. So I don't have those yet. But uh, in any case, this is something that the students can use when they come to the automation school. They can actually use this and, and uh, actually do lessons on it. So this is a physical demo unit that we have here. In addition to all the S7-1200s and 1500s we have in the training room. So in any case, with that said, I'm going to slide this over a little bit so we can get the PLC in here. This 1200 CPU right there. And uh, that way we'll be able to see if we get all the lights to go off. So let me switch back over to the computer. And um, we can see everything here. All the parts came right in, which is really cool. Now, to make this work, first of all, I'm going to have to give it an IP address. And I want this to be 192.168.2. No, Yesterday was 213, so today will be 214. Okay. And I also have to give it a device name. This is the default. You can allow the software to give the, the device a default name, but we're going to stay with the nomenclature we used so far in this series of videos. And that would be DIO ET200 SP. And we're going to call this Rack 2. Okay. So let me copy that out of there. And now that Profinet name is very important. We'll talk about that in a minute. But with that, let me go into the I.O. here. And I tried to keep the I.O. tags from the previous. It, it did delete the ones that I didn't have. So I had 16, or actually I had 10 push buttons and 10 pilot lights, but these cards only have eight. So you can see my other I.O. tags got deleted um, automatically. So I, I wish they would have let them, left them in there. What if I go back to the 16 point module? Well, whatever. Um, that's the way it works. So in any case, let me switch over like this since I won't be using the catalog. And so that's why I reused yesterday's because I didn't want to have to go in here and put those all in. Now, if we go to a program, right, we're going to see these guys don't exist. So what's going to happen there? Let's go ahead and uh, compile. And says, so, hey, that's fine. We like it. I wonder if that'll cause us a problem later on because these don't exist. Well, they don't exist on that I.O. card anyways. So let's go to our PLC tags and see if it left them in there. Default tag table. Yep, it actually left them in. We just don't see them in the I.O., but it didn't, it didn't delete them on me. So 9 and 10 are still in there, which is good, which is very good. Okay, great. So with that said, I think we're ready to go down and try it. It's not going to work, of course. If you saw yesterday's video, you'll know why, but... It, it's not going to work because of something else we have to do. But let's go ahead and do a download. I'll select the PLC. I'll select download. And we'll go ahead and uh, download to the PLC. And start search. And it's looking for it. There it is. So let's load it in. All set. Okay. So I'm switching over to putting all of the, now I did not get the password error. I am using version 17, but because I'm reusing this uh, file from uh, the last episode, which was yesterday for me, um, I already set it to disable password. So I'm going to continue without synchronization and I'm going to load it in. And of course, if you any of this is confusing to you, I do a whole soup to nuts course. It's called S7. Uh, PLC Basics Level 1 at the Automation School, and I also do it in person. Right now, we have a waiting list for the upcoming uh, um, classes, which I haven't picked dates for, but I'll be picking dates for them soon. So get on the waiting list over at theautomationschool.com that slash live dot com slash live if you want to get on the waiting list for the upcoming in-person classes where you'll actually be able to get your hands on this stuff. Um, so let's go ahead and start the module. 
and just check and make sure everything's good. And this will just take a moment. So one thing that's going to happen is, and if you read the Profinet, like I was doing last night, if you read the, well, the other night, if you read the Profinet manual, you'll find that they decided, they stay in the manual, they decided not to uh, commission the I.O. devices with IP addresses like a lot of other vendors do. You commission them with Profinet names. And so if we go online here, we're going to see that the, the PLC is not happy because it's not going to find, yep, see it down here? It can't find a distributed I.O. It's like, I don't see anybody on the network. Now, it says I.O. device one. I really thought we changed that. Okay. Yeah, we did right here. Okay. So the name is still I.O. device one, but the actual Profinet device name is, and I, sh I should have changed that to make them the same, but it's irrelevant. It's, this is the important part, right? And it can't find that. So you can see here, everything is like, no good, no data, not reachable. Okay, well, that's very interesting, but how we get around that? Well, the way we're going to get around that is we're going to come down here to online access. We're going to update our list again here because I probably didn't need to because I just updated it. We're going to go to that accessible device, which is the only new the device I've added to the network. If I added multiples, then I would have to figure out what the MAC address was of each. But because I've only put one new device on and I'm in a closed system here in the uh, studio, uh, I know that's the right one. So... I open up the uh, online diagnostics, I go to functions, and now I could give it the IP address, but to show you that the PLC will assign the IP address if I put in the correct Profinet device name, I'm just going to put in that Profinet device name, which I copied, so let's paste it in there, assign name, and I'm trying to use different names and different addresses so that I can put these all on the network at the same time if I wanted to. So in any case, I've assigned the name, it says I got a checkbox down here in the bottom right hand corner. So everything's looking good there. And look, as soon as I assigned the name, the PLC went all green. It's like very happy. It's like, hey, everything's good. And so that's great. Now, if these modules, any of these modules would have been a slightly different part number, the part numbers changed depending on the age of them. You know, over time, the part numbers rev, if you would. And then uh, if I had the version, wrong version selected. Um, but because I read this online, it's all correct. Um, and I know you're not always going to have all the files online. You can grab them out of the library here. Um, I'll show that for the members. I'll go through that in a deeper dive here in a moment. But in any case, I did want to show you that. And now uh, the last thing I want to show you here is if we come down here to that device and open up the online diagnostics again, right? And I'm not seeing it because I have to do an update accessible devices. Now let's open it up this time and see if we, yes, now in the general, we're actually getting the uh, designation, the article number, the version 421, um, and so on. So uh, that's good because I'm gonna use that to do a manual build of this next. But in any cases, typically if you're gonna create a brand new project, you're gonna assume you're gonna get the newest stuff from the factory. Of course, if you have an older version of the software and you're doing a brand new project, you may not have all those new uh, items added to your uh, TIA portal, in which case you can go up to uh, tools here and add, uh, oh, I can't do it online, but in any case, there is the option here to, right here on the options, to uh, uh, bring in your GSD files, okay? But of course, I'm not going to do that because we're all set for now. So now let's go back out and see if everything's working, right? My program should work. I should be able to press buttons and turn lights on, right? So I'm not going to, I'm just going to turn this on just to try it here. Let's see before we go out to the other camera and, uh, all right, it looks like it's working. So let's go back out to the overhead camera here and everything's green. That's great. Everything's happy. And so I'm going to press the first button and the first light comes on. There we go. This is just the way I decided to wire it up. Excellent. You can see the indicators on the uh, different modules that come on and off. Um, and again, I don't have anything on the analog. They're just wired to each other, but eventually I'll put some stuff in here for the analog as time allows. But in any case, I wanted to show you that um, if you're a, a member and you're watching the member version of this video, hang on, we'll do this the long format way by building it manually. But I do want to thank all our regular uh, viewers out there 
Um, whether you're on the automationblog.com or YouTube or LinkedIn, I really want to thank you for tuning in and watching this. And uh, I do want to thank Siemens again for sending in the hardware and sponsoring this episode so it would be ad free. And with that, um, if you're not a member, I'm going to wish you all good health and happiness. And until next time, my friends, peace.